increase our gratitude for God's loving kindness in the past and give us courage for the future. When I taught early morning seminary in the early years of my marriage and the first years of a new job, my prayers for the help of the Spirit focused on what seemed to me the difficulty of meeting conflicting demands. I felt challenged by the new obligations I had assumed. I wanted to be a good husband. My wife is here, and she can say how well I've done. I, I wanted to be a good husband, a valued employee of a university, and a faithful teacher of the gospel to a seminary class. These were all new commitments, and all came at the same time. Under these pressures, and in my inexperience, when I prayed about my seminary teaching, was usually to ask for the Spirit to show me how to teach the class. I prayed over the teaching materials. I prayed over the scriptures. I recognize now that the only individual I prayed for at first was myself. The class I prayed for was only faces and a few names. I had nine or ten students before me, even on a good day. Yet I didn't at first pray to discern the needs of individuals. I simply pled for the Spirit to come into that classroom so that all of us, a teacher and students, could be taught. I still remember the chill in the gray dawn as the students came through the classroom door. To me, they looked tired. I looked into their eyes and I saw a little response and a high likelihood of them going to sleep. I hoped that they couldn't see in my face the growing anxiety I felt in those first weeks. Answers to my prayers for the Spirit to come into our class seemed not to come. From that feeling of failure came a painful but lasting lesson. Despite, despite my prayers and efforts, two young men in that class walked past me each morning without speaking on their way to the back row of chairs in the classroom. The chairs were movable. They chose adjoining chairs and so turned them so that they could, I could not see their faces, nor could they see mine. I still remember the backs of their letter jackets. They never disrupted. In fact, they never spoke that I recall. I realize now what an opportunity that created for the class and for me. I prayed and I worked harder. And my prayers grew more intense for the two boys whose backs I watched as I taught. I learned all I could about them. I prayed for them individually and by name. I prayed for their parents whom I came to know. As I look back now, I realize that the Spirit answered my prayers by increasing my love for those two boys and my desire to reach them. But more than that, my concern for them ignited a personal concern for their classmates. I began to teach them and pray for each as individuals. The Spirit came into the classroom. I still remember the feelings of love for the Savior and, his, and for us as we talked about the, the book of Hosea. Now, if you know about that Old Testament book and about teenage seminary students, you know the Spirit came. There was evidence that the Spirit was there even in Hosea. So I learned that for me, there is greater power in praying for a child of God than for a group of them. It was years before I learned other lessons from those days in that seminary class. One of those two boys, now a father, approached me after a state conference. He had grown older and balder, and so had I. He was smiling with his hand on the shoulder of a handsome son, about the age his father was when he was in my seminary class. He said to me, I just wanted my son to have the opportunity to meet you. From his warm smile, the happiness in his voice, and his son's wide-eyed look of admiration, I knew my prayers of long before had been answered.